It's been 2,000 years since the glorious light of the cross illuminated a world veiled in darkness and confusion about the character of God. And still today, the greatest need of mankind is a revelation of God's love as revealed in the life of Christ. Amazing Facts presents the Everlasting Gospel with Pastor Doug Batchelor. Coming to you each week from Sacramento Central Church in sunny California. Discover hidden treasures in God's Word today. Holy Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus because we know we're not worthy to come in our own name, but he paid the price for everyone within the sound of my voice. And I pray in a special way for those church members, family, and friends that are ill at this time. Some are suffering from physical illness, some from mental, some from financial. We pray that your healing balm will go out and, and heal them and deliver them and that we'll all make our calling and election sure. We have a special burden this morning for our children and for our loved ones that are out of the ark of safety. We pray in a special way, Lord, that you'll help them to redeem the time for the days are evil and that Jesus is coming soon. Awaken in their hearts uh, the love that they once had for thee. Bring them back, Lord, into this message so that they can be saved along with us and many others that we will reach out to. Be with Pastor Doug today. Pour your spirit out upon him. Speak through him as never before. And those that are discouraged among us, help them to leave with a cheerful heart because we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. morning. I'd like to wish everybody a happy Sabbath and want to especially extend a welcome to any visitors that might be here. Our message this morning is dealing with the subject of the days of Noah and Lot. Now I shared something similar to this a couple of years ago and uh, as with many Bible subjects the subject was much bigger than the time allotted and so you could call this part two if you want but I thought it was really relevant for us to consider this very important warning that Jesus gave to the world regarding his second coming. And uh, during our scripture reading, Christ gave a number of signs and conditions that existed in the days of Noah and Lot. He said, you will see that repeated prior to the second coming. I love history. Um, it's one of the only subjects I did well in in school uh, because it's made up of stories and I like the stories I always remember very well and Rome was of course the greatest empire of the world in its glory which was largely during the time of Christ from Julius Caesar through the 40 year reign of Augustus Caesar that was really Rome in its prime in many respects uh, the territory reached through the Mediterranean, Spain, finally off into Great Britain and, and uh, parts of Persia, Egypt, a uh, tremendous empire. We always think of Rome and the decadence of Rome, but you know, for a while there, Rome was a very uh, well-run, organized, moral culture. They called it Pax Romana, the Roman peace. Um, divorce was prohibited, greatly frowned upon. They respected freedoms, especially among Roman citizens. There's a lot of uh, morality. The, the Roman soldiers were the police force and laws were enforced and, and freedoms were respected. And uh, uh, it was, you know, for the day in which they existed, somewhat of a moral empire. But with success came prosperity. And with prosperity, slowly the morals began to erode. And a lot is said about the fall of Rome because we know that when... Babylon fell, it fell in a decisive battle with Medo-Persia. We know that when the Persians fell, they fell in a decisive battle with Alexander the Great. And the Greek Empire fell to the Romans. But when Rome fell, it's been the subject of a lot of study, it was a crumbling. It was like an erosion. It happened little by little. 
it wasn't one battle where someone came and conquered Rome. Uh, though many like Hannibal tried, they had failed. In his classic, Edward Gibbon wrote regarding the fall of the Roman Empire, he attributes the fall to five things. And here's what they are. And see if you see any similarity between these things that preexisted before the fall of Rome and what's happening in our nation and world today. The undermining of the dignity and the sanctity of the home. Does that exist in the world today? It seems like instead of parents having the responsibility for the children, that's being shunted over to the government and the state. The increasing taxes and the spending of public money for bread and circuses. This is what was happening in Rome. Uh, one of our founding fathers, I can't remember which one, he said that as soon as the people realize they can vote themselves benefits from the national treasury, we're doomed. And when the people realize they can vote in people that will give them benefits, we're doomed. I think that day has come. Point number three, Gibbon said in his book, the mad craze for pleasure with sports becoming exciting and more brutal. Of course, you know what happened in the Colosseums with the entertainment and the, the gladiators and the uh, persecution of the, the Christians. Do we have sports becoming more brutal? The extremes? <laughs> Extreme everything now. The building of armaments when the real enemy was the decadence of the people. The decay in point number five was the decay of religion with faith fading into mere form, but uh, true morality in religion was lost. All these things we can see existing in the world today. Philip Myers, in his book, Rome, Its Rise and Its Fall, he observed, speaking of the fall of Rome, almost from its beginning, the Roman stage was gross and immorality was one of the main agencies to which uh, must be attributed the undermining of the originally sound moral life of, of Roman society. So absorbed did the people become, speaking of in the stage, in theatrical performances, so absorbed did people become with DVDs in ancient Rome. I'm just wondering if you're listening. In the indecent representations of the stage that they lost all thought and care for the affairs of real life. People began to live in a fantasy world. Everything they talked about was entertainment today. They wanted to know what's happening in Hollywood. And it's like people lived in this fictitious world of what's going on with the stage and the latest performance and the entertainment and the sports and the pleasures. And I thought that was interesting because it reminds me of the statements that Jesus makes regarding the last days. And by the way, Jesus is not the only one. Second Timothy 3, verse 1 through 5, Paul describes conditions in the world prior to the second coming. Oh, why am I preaching this message? It's because I think we're near the end of the world. And I want you to think about the signs that the Lord is giving us socially. Second Timothy 3 verse 1, But this know that in the last days perilous times will come. What is the peril? Men will be lovers of money, lovers of themselves, lovers of money. By the way, what is God? God is love for others. What is sin? It's the opposite of God. Sin is love for self. So where you've got a lot of love for self, you've got a lot of sin. Lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but not denying its power. They still got the form of religion. Did the people that crucified Jesus have a form of religion? A lot of religious rites, ceremony, ritual, but not the power, not the power of love. And from such turn away. I'd like to return to the passage in Luke that we started with. And I want to bring to your attention the specifics that Jesus mentions. Luke 17 this is one of the places in Luke where Jesus tells about signs before the second coming. It's also in Luke 21, Luke 17, Luke 21. Then, of course, the other passages are Matthew 24, Mark 13. Those are the four primary places where Jesus gives signs and conditions in the world prior to the second coming. Here we are in Luke 17, verse 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, 
so will it be also in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all, right up till that time. Likewise, as also it was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And he goes on and says, Let him who is on his housetop and all his goods in the house, let him not come down to take them. And likewise, if you're in the field, don't return back. Then Jesus utters the shortest verse in the Bible next to Jesus wept. Remember Lot's wife. So Christ is commanding us to understand his return, to consider what happened back then. Because there are many parallels that we can learn from. Now, Peter refers to this also. The same two great days of probation closing Peter refers to. Noah and Lot. Notice 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but He cast them down into hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and if He did not spare the ancient world, but He saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing a flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with destruction, making them an example to those who should afterward live ungodly, and He delivered righteous Lot... You notice he says, Righteous Noah, righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. And notice, Lot was grieved. He was sighing and crying for the abominations that were done in Sodom. That's going to come up later. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Even though Lot was surrounded with that, he was still delivered. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the judgment day. Everybody here, everybody listening, there's two choices. Deliver from temptation, reserve for judgment. Noah, delivered. The people in the flood, judgment. Lot, delivered. The others, judgment. You can figure out where you're going to be, but everybody's going to either be delivered from temptation or reserved for judgment. Then he identifies some of the characteristics of that day. Now listen to the specifics I've itemized here. Eating? Anything wrong with eating? If so, try and give it up. I mean, you've got to eat, right? Drinking? Marriage? Planting? Building? Buying? Selling? Oh, why would Jesus give those things as a sign of the second coming? The Lord is not saying just these events by themselves, but these events to excess. These events become the God. Let's start with eating and drinking. And by the way, you've uh, heard about the, um, the wild orgies they had in Rome. Uh, that, we always think about the... Um, immorality or the sexual perversion connected with that but it was often around food they were living for food it was just one never ending potluck matter of fact and I don't want to gross you out and I don't want to be insensitive but it is a fact of history that the Romans would gorge themselves at these feasts then they had a place where they would go and regurgitate what they'd eat, eat and they called them vomitoriums and then they'd go eat some more now there's nothing wrong with eating but how many would agree that's eating to excess I mean, it's one thing to eat to live. It's another thing where you live to eat. The purpose in life is just the pleasure, the he hedonistic pursuit of physical pleasure. Well, that's one of the signs of our day, eating and drinking. Listen to what uh, Solomon said, Ecclesiastes 10, verse 16. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your princes feast in the morning. Blessed are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobles, and your princes eat in due season. There's a time to eat. You don't eat when it's not the time to eat. You don't eat all day long. For strength and not for drunkenness. It is okay to eat for strength, but we're not to eat for drunkenness. But in our culture today, 
There are more varieties of things to eat than there ever have been. We want more, more variety, bigger. You know, they started out, it was great when you could go to the convenience store and get a soda, but then they got the large soda, and they got the jumbo, then they got the big gulp. And now you just about roll in your own 55-gallon drum. Everything is done to excess. Just You get a pickup truck just to hold your cup holder. Now they've got programs where people revel in watching others cook. I can't believe they get the Food Channel. What do you watch? I watch the Food Channel. I mean, it's, it's like it's done, it's like you deify it. Um, notice talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. When you think of Sodom and Gomorrah, we typically think of the sexual perversion, right? And the Bible talks about that. Listen to what Ezekiel says was one of the principal problems in Sodom and Gomorrah. Look, this is, by the way, Ezekiel 16, verse 49 and 50. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter, meaning Gomorrah, had pride, fullness of food. You know, one of the reasons for that was, the Bible tells us, that the valley of Sodom and, and Gomorrah was like the garden of God. One reason Lot wanted to go there is it was a very fertile area before it was destroyed and it turned into a valley of salt. It was like the Garden of God. They had an abundance of crops and food and grass and pastures for the sheep. And Lot didn't plan on moving into the cities of Sodom. He cast his tent towards Sodom. And gradually, you know, he started out camping outside the city and little by little shopping in the city pretty soon they thought well you know they've actually got so many conveniences in the city and maybe it might have been some Im uh, pressure from his wife and children because the malls were in Sodom and so pretty soon he was living in the city by the time the angels came it vexed him though he didn't want to be there so it made you think there must have been some outside pressure but there was an abundance of food that's one of the characteristics do we eat to live or live to eat? By the way, sometimes Adventist Christians are criticized because we talk about the health message and having control over our appetites, but we quickly forget that sin entered our world because someone ate something they weren't supposed to eat. So does it matter? I was reading this article. You've seen me quote it before, and this is a cover from National Geographic. Um, oh, I can't remember. I think it's January 2004. We now have more overweight people in the world than hungry ones. There are more than a billion overweight, overnourished people in the world and 800 million who are undernourished. We always heard about all the starving people in the world. This is the first time in the history of the world that there have been more people that are actually overnourished than undernourished. Would you say that we've reached the age where we are eating and drinking in abundance? And it goes on there, if you keep reading in Ezekiel, talking about Sodom, if you read in verse 50, And they were haughty, and they committed abomination before me, therefore I took them away. What is the abomination that they committed in Sodom? Not only the eating and drinking and idleness. Oh, by the way, I left out the idleness. Do we have, you know, we have more idleness now. When America was founded in the 1700s, and even if you go back 100 years, 80% of people lived on farms. They lived in rural communities. Now, because of the mechanization of farming, only about 20% of the people in North America live in rural communities. 80% live in the cities and the great metropolitan areas. There's so many machines that do all the work for us now. We've even got robots that do what used to be done in factories. And there's a lot more ease and idleness. And you know how many people now... When advertising portrays the average American worker, you know where they are? They work in a cubicle at a desk sitting. The average American worker is working in a cubicle sitting. An abundance of idleness chatting with their friends in other cubicles. But one of the sins, it says they committed abominations. What is that abomination? Leviticus 18.22 you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. The abomination was sexual perversion, homosexuality. And if you still have any doubts, Jude chapter 1 verse 7, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them 
in similar manner to these, having given themselves over, they gave up to it, sexual immorality and going after strange flesh. Romans chapter 1, Paul refers to that as that which is not natural. Perversion. More specifically, homosexuality. And this is a delicate subject, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I think it's an irrefutable sign of the times that was once declared inappropriate and illegal in North America. And by the, word, by the way, there is a word based on the town Sodom that coins that behavior, is now warmly accepted in the general culture and the laws are there to protect. I don't know if you've been plugged into what's happening even here in California, but there are two or three laws on the books right now that will increase the rights of people that might have alternate sexual preferences. Would you say that that uh, prophecy is fulfilled as it was in the days of Lot? Yeah, I think so. Sexual perversion? I understand that the, uh, the Episcopal Church and more churches are debating the acceptance of a clergy and not to mention members into their fellowship that are practicing homosexuals living with they could be homosexual or lesbian living with lovers and is it the I gotta be careful what I say here but I think that I think it is that the uh, one of the leaders of the Episcopal Church left his wife has a, um, a partner and they have voted to accept that uh, as uh, appropriate well, you've got to read a different Bible than I read to come to that conclusion. And it's considered... Do you know Amazing Facts has been taken off some channels in Canada? Because I make statements like this and it's considered insensitive. Hate speech. If you preach what the Bible says is sin, it's called hate speech. I think that either God needs to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah or something's going to happen. God is just patient and so we presume on His patience. Another characteristic is the buying and the selling. Anything wrong with buying and selling? How many of you bought or sold anything this week? Is it a sin to buy and sell? But can things be done to excess? We're living in an age now where there is more that can be bought and sold than any other time. We have channels that are dedicated to buying all the time. Shopping channels. It's not enough that you eventually take your one day a week and you go to the store and get your groceries. Now we got to watch other people shop or you shop without even leaving the house because you watch it on TV, you call and order it or you go online and you surf for every conceivable product. And uh, you know what? There are some advantages to uh, buying things online. You can sometimes get some good deals. But think about the materialism in the age in which we live right now. There are more things you can buy or sell now than any other time in the history of the world. The essence of the worldly man is someone said he knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. The world's motive is profit. The Christian's desire should be to serve. But it's worldly collecting, building treasures here on earth. James chapter 4 verse 13 and 14. Come now, you who say tomorrow we will go to such a city and spend a year there and buy and sell and make a profit. Wherefore, you don't know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It's a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Jesus specifically warns against materialism in the last days. Luke 17, you know when he's talking about Lot's wife just before he gets there, notice what he says. In that day he was on his housetop, like when Noah was told to enter the ark and Lot was told to flee the city. He didn't say, after you pack your bags, flee the city. He said, flee now, make haste, don't look back. Jesus said, speaking of the destruction of the world and the destruction of Jerusalem, if you're on your housetop and your goods are in the house, don't even come down and turn back into the house. Likewise, if you're in the field, don't go back to your house. Run for your life. So many people would say, I, I want to go, but I've got this stuff in my house. My stuff. Buying and selling. It's talking about a love for things. We find our value not in that we are made in God's image, but in the stuff that we own. And let's face it, a lot of people feel like you've got to keep up with society. And you know, one of the reasons that we are largely a world in debt right now is because of the pressure to live above the standard of our earning. And so we borrow for everything. And you're encouraged to do it. Probably once a day, I throw in the garbage 
another application that I did not ask for for another credit card. And it makes me mad because they're so tricky on the envelopes, they get me to open them. Urgent announcement, you know, something like that. And it's just, oh, it's urgent. I better look. I might be throwing away a you know, check from Bill Gates or something. I don't know what's in there. And it's another application or a home. They want me to take out a loan on my home. That's the other thing, just all the time. So they're urging you to go into debt, aren't they? Buy and sell, buy and sell. It's materialism, worldly, worldly love of money. It's interesting. You know, when we talk about Sodom, and we're going to get to this a little bit, and when we talk about Noah, probation closed for the people outside the ark. Probation closed for the people that were um, in Sodom. Am I right? And then there are several examples in the Bible of probation closing. It closes for individuals. King Saul, would you say probation closed for him when God wouldn't speak to him anymore? Judas went out and it was night. Satan entered him. Probation closed. Probation might close for a couple. Ananias and Sapphira. They grieved away the Holy Spirit and dropped dead. I'd say probation closed. It can happen for a family. Probation can close for a whole family. Achan. They were given several days to confess. And maybe even after probation closed for Achan, the family could have said, you know, our father's the one. Little by little they cast lots, but nobody would, nobody, they put their family ahead of God. And God says, you've got to put me first. You've got to love me more than husband, wife, child, anything, right? Probation closed for the family of Achan. Probation can close for a city. Sodom, Gomorrah, you read the prophecies, probation closed for many ancient cities. For a nation, when Babylon fell, happened suddenly. The judgment was written on the walls. You're weighed in the balance and found wanting. You're going to die tonight. Probation closed for Belshazzar. Isn't that right? In 34 AD, probation closed for ancient Israel. When they plugged their ears for a nation, there were people in the nation that were saved, but they'd lost their, their freedom as a nation. It was destroyed. Probation closed, but they went on another 40 years as a nation. But their purpose had closed. And probation can close for a world as it did in the days of Noah. And it will happen again. Of these examples of where probation closed, with Judas, Ananias and Sapphira, and Achan, it was materialism. Wasn't it? When it fell for Babylon, they were drinking and eating when probation closed. And so there's many examples I could show through the Bible where these are the characteristics. And Jesus says they married and they were given in marriage. Now, is there anything wrong with marriage? Isn't eating and drinking and marriage God's idea? So what is it saying? Why would that be different than any other time? God has specified a few things about marriage. First of all, God hates divorce. He says that. Secondly, you're supposed to marry someone in the same faith. So when it says married and given in marriage, it means they were marrying repeatedly. That means they were divorcing repeatedly. And they were marrying outside their faith. Before the flood, what led to the flood? You read in Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God, those are the descendants of Seth, who believed in God. Adam, who was the son of God, remember? Luke chapter 3. The descendants of Seth, the sons of God, saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them wives of all whom they chose. And when the children of Seth began to intermarry with the descendants of Cain, the daughters of men, men meaning enos, mortal, carnal, the distinction of holiness was lost. And then God says, right after it says, the sons of God began to intermarry with the lost world, the wickedness of man was great in the earth and every thought of his heart was only evil continually. Through these marriages with the unbelievers. Now I'm going to be sensitive and please forgive me. I, I, I remember I've not been in the church that long. I guess I have been 30 years now. I'm getting old. I've been saying it for so long, it finally dawned on me, it ain't true anymore. Anyway, but when I joined the church 30 years ago, if a person was marrying somebody who was out of the faith that was cause for disfellowshipping from the church, they didn't have to drink or smoke or commit adultery, just marry someone who is not a member. They could be a member of another denomination and you are relieved from your membership. Now, show of hands, how many remember that? Am I the only one that remembers that? See? And by the way, that wasn't just our church. That was the Baptist church, the Methodist church, many churches. 
Catholics used to do it. You married someone who wasn't a Catholic, excommunication. But now, marrying and giving in marriage, it's just like anybody, anything that will slow down, doesn't matter if it's the same sex or not. I think they must have a marriage channel too. <laughs> you know, I think it's interesting. When Abraham left Ur, it tells about Terah, it tells about Abram's brother, it tells about Abram and Sarah, it tells about Lot. It doesn't say Abraham, it says Abraham and his wife, Sarah, and Lot, his nephew. It doesn't say Lot's wife. Which makes you wonder if Lot married someone from Canaan which could help understand why she looked back. He married a Canaanite, which is one reason they wanted to live. Maybe her family. Kids got to be by grandma and grandpa. They're in Sodom. I'm speculating now, but you can't prove me wrong, so I can do it. <laughs> planting. Let's talk about farming. Anything wrong with planting? This last week we were up in the hills and someone fed me out of their garden. It was great eating those fresh picked tomatoes. But now we're living in an age where there's been planting on a scale as never before. You fly across North America in a jet and you can just see the, the incredible farms from 35,000 feet up in the sky as far as you can see practically in any direction when you're flying over the Midwest it's corn and wheat and beans and orchards and on a scale and not just planting now we have genetically altered foods genetically altered farms and some of these things are wonders but you know one reason it's saying even these good things don't miss this point I think Jesus is saying when it happens, when it happened to the people in Noah's day, they were doing all the regular pursuits of life. They were still building right up to the end. They were still marrying, they were still farming, they were still eating and drinking. In Noah's day, in, I'm sorry, in Lot's time, in Sodom, that morning, that very day when the fire was going to come down, it was a beautiful day, like 9-11 five years ago. What a beautiful morning. Everybody got up and they cooked their coffee and went to church. Went to work, rather. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, it would seem like a day like every other day, right? But was it different? On the outside, it looked similar. Planting. I think it's interesting. Uh, Luke chapter 12, speaking of another man for whom probation closed, he spoke a parable. Verse 16 unto them. The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. You know that parable? And he had a bumper crop. And he said, what will I do with my bumper crop? I'm going to pull down my barns and I'll build bigger barns. And there I'll put the crops that I've got. And I'll say, soul, take it easy. You've got things laid up. You've got goods for many years. Eat, drink, and be merry. And God said, you fool, this night your soul is required of you. You notice in that one parable, it talks about eating, drinking, building, planting, and then judgment. That one parable. Christ is trying to tell us maybe you're not going to get a fax or an email the day that probation closes. It could look like a normal day. Unless you're watching the signs of the Holy Spirit. Noah was listening to the Holy Spirit that told him about building the ark. Lot listened to the voice of angels that said you better get out of town. If we're not plugged into God then we won't even know when probation's closed. The Holy Spirit was taken away from Samson. Samson got up to shake himself and fight the Philistines as other times and he did not know the Lord had left him. This is the warning Jesus is giving us. Are we going to know? I'm getting ahead of myself. Building. Anything wrong with building? I love to build. Any of you men like to build? Building's not a sin. But it's talking about a scale of excess unlike any other time in history. Have we reached that point now? Now, I think one of these pictures is actually China. Well, I've never seen anything like what I saw, and I've been all over the world. When I went to China, what was that, about a year ago, dear? Beijing, they're getting ready for the Olympics. And you look out 
on the skyline and you will see a virtual forests of cranes raising up buildings in every direction. I've never seen, I don't believe there's ever been any nation in the world that has grown so rapidly as what's happening in China right now. They are flush with money. Guess where they're getting it? If you have any question about where they're getting it, look on every product you buy at Walmart. See where it's made. Almost every product. Go to say this case, a lawyer gets a hold of the tape. <laughs> it's just amazing. I went to Costco the other day. Our VCR broke. We have all these tapes. Everything's DVD now. So I needed to get a VCR so I could watch all the old tapes I used to watch. So I went through and they still had a few left at Costco, Price Club. I was just curious and I flipped over the box of everyone in the aisle. Made in China, made in China, made in China, made in China. Toshiba, made in Taiwan. <laughs> which is right near China. <laughs> Building like never before. And when you fly a small plane, just fly over the Sacramento Valley and go fly around Roseville Lincoln. It's like a city fell out of the sky. One amazing facts put their office there about 12 years ago there were fields around. All fields. And all just buildings and cities and all the infrastructure. And it's really nice because it's all brand spanking new but it's like it dropped out of the sky. Building on a scale like never before. Are we there? Now they say the market's cooling off a little bit but uh, it's going to come back again. Fact is that we're living in an age where they're building. And hey, do they have channels and programs that talk about home makeover, buildings and design and are people worshiping their houses? The world is preoccupied right now with embellishing their earthly homes to the neglect of their heavenly home. We're not sending any materials on ahead because we're preoccupied with this stuff. And Jesus said, it's all going to burn. I mean, we, it's okay to be comfortable. You spend a lot of time in your house, but some folks, it's like they live for their home, the design. Now, I want you to, I want to redirect your attention. We looked at some of the criteria that is uh, prior to the second coming. Go to Revelation chapter 7. I'm going to talk a little more about what Jesus addresses the close of probation. Revelation chapter 7 verse 1. After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. These winds are winds of strife and trouble, tribulation. That the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea or any tree. Trees are symbols of nations, sea, people. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servant of our God in their foreheads. If we're going to survive the coming judgment, there must be a seal that's received on the forehead. To understand this, it probably would be a good idea, read in your Bibles, Ezekiel, go with me, to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 9. This is one of the places where it talks about the seal of God in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Revelation we just read, unless they've got the seal of God, these winds of strife will blow upon them. Why? What's holding back right now the winds of strife, the judgments from coming? By the way, those winds of strife you read after chapter 7, and after chapter um, uh, 14, it's talking of the 144,000 are in both those chapters. The seven last plagues fall. Those winds of strife are the seven last plagues. Chapter 9 of Ezekiel, verse 1. He's in vision. And he calls out in my hearing with a loud voice, saying, Let those who have charge over the city draw near each man with a deadly weapon, destroying weapon in his hand. We don't know what these weapons were. And suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate. This takes place around the sanctuary as many of the visions do in the Bible. Which faces north, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen. And we don't know if this is a, se a seventh individual. It's not clear. And had a writer's inkhorn at his side. And they went in and they stood beside the bronze altar. Is it clear this is in the temple? 
Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been and the threshold of the temple and he called to the man clothed with linen. Oh, by the way, when this marking is taking place, it says the glory of the Lord of Israel had gone up. This is a filling with the Spirit that's going to happen on God's people while this marking is happening. And he called to the man clothed with the linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. Angels don't go around with inkhorns and feathers and quills. It's just saying that some instrument for marking, some instrument for destruction. We don't have, they're not AK-47s. We don't know what angels use. When there's war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and his angels, I doubt they use swords. Do you agree? I mean, we don't know what angels use to fight. They're spiritual beings. But he's got this something to make a mark. He said, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the forehead of the men. Now, wait a second. If I were to stop right here and you've not read this before, you might think the ones who are getting marked, that's bad. Mark on the forehead, mark of the beast. No, everybody in Revelation is marked. You want the right mark. These who are marked are saved. Who is getting this mark in the forehead that saves? It's interesting. Put a mark on the foreheads of those who sigh and cry over the abominations that are done in the city. Do you remember reading a few moments ago where Jude said that, or Peter said that Lot was vexed when he saw the wickedness of what was happening in Sodom. Vexed his righteous soul. Sighed and cried. When Jesus wept over Jerusalem, was his soul vexed over the sin of God's people? When we see the condition of the church, do you say, oh well, everyone's doing it, or do you look at Jesus and say, we need a revival? Is it, does it grieve you, the indifference about God and holy things? Who is going to receive the seal of God? Those that want the Holy Spirit, that want a holy life. They sigh and cry. They're praying. They're not just wringing their hands. They're sighing and crying. They're sighing and crying before God. They're praying for revival. That needs to be our attitude. You know, the Lord is telling me to tell you these things. This, you're hearing the truth today. I have absolute confidence you're hearing the truth today. I hope you know that. And, and this is something I think the church needs to hear. And it may not be popular, and some will probably criticize it, and some of you will come and go and not even know that God spoke to you. But there needs to be a revival in the church, and we need to be grieved over sin and not be comfortable with it. Put a mark on the foreheads of the men, and that means the people, men and women, who sigh and cry over the abominations that are done within it. To the others, the ones, the six who've got the destroying weapons, he said, go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare. It's the kind of judgment that fell on the people in Noah's day and the people in Lot's day. It's annihilation. Utterly slay old and young maids and little children, women, but do not come near anybody on whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. That's why Peter says judgment must begin at the house of God. Begin at my sanctuary. And they did. This great judgment takes place. That's a time when probation closes. If we do not have the mark, when the marking's happening, then it's too late. I want to go back to this subject here. Of the seal of God. Daniel chapter 12, the close of probation. Verse 1. How do we know when probation's closed? Well, you may not know until the plagues start. At that time, it's too late. At that time, Michael will stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there will be a time of trouble such as there never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, your people will be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. What book is that? It's the book of life. And then it says that many that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. A resurrection takes place. Is it clear to you that by the time the resurrection takes place, probation is closed? There's a great time of trouble between the time probation closes and the resurrection takes place. That's when the seven last plagues fall out. Revelation 22.11 Jesus will declare at that time when Michael stands up, Let the unjust be unjust still. Let him who is filthy be filthy still. Let he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and let him who is holy be holy still. You know, one of the things I love about the goodness of God, you can read in Ezekiel where he says, I believe it's in chapter uh, 20, 
If the wicked man will forsake, I think it's chapter 18 rather. If a wicked man forget, forsakes all of his wickedness and does what that is right, all of his wickedness will be forgotten. Isn't that good news? But if the righteous man forsakes his righteousness, all of his righteousness will be forgotten if he does what's wicked. Right now people can have changes of heart one way or the other. People come into the church, people go out of the church. But when Michael stands up, he basically says, those that are righteous, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, you'll never change again. You're locked in. Those that are wicked, the door of mercy is forever closed. Just like the door of the ark was closed seven days before the rain came. We don't know how long Lot was out of Sodom before the fire fell, but there was a period of time when he was heading for the hills that he was out, they were doomed, and they didn't know it, going around the regular business. We're not going to see an acrobatic plane trailing a cloud of smoke, riding in the sky, probation closes in 10 minutes, get ready. The Lord is telling us that we need to be ready now, today. And then there's that verse that we read in Hebrews 2, one of the most disturbing verses in the Bible. Ver Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It's through just neglecting it. What else can God do if we neglect it? Which leads me to my next important point. God is long-suffering. God is not willing that any should perish. He is patient. He is abounding in mercy. But there is a limit to God's patience. God has been so patient with me. I pray He will not cease to be patient with me. I pray that God is patient with me. But I know that there's a limit to His patience because I see it biblically. It's in history. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 11. Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men are fully set in them to do evil. In other words, because God is patient and He does not sting us with a hot shot as soon as we disobey. You ever seen, they've got these um, collars you can put on a dog. It's a training collar and it gives them an electric jolt. And um, you got a button. And if the dog does something it's not supposed to do when you try to train it, you press the button. <laughs> Whenever it jumps up on you. <laughs> and because sentence is speedy, then they, they learn very quickly. I remember they used to have this smoking program where they used to try and help people stop smoking. Every time they went to put a cigarette to mouth, they'd give them a little shock. Any of you remember that? I think they stopped doing that because they started having psychotic problems of some sort. But God doesn't operate that way, does He? When you tell a lie, does a bolt of lightning come down? Or you think the thought you're not supposed to think? You get shocked like that, oh, sorry, Lord. Now there are times, sometimes it just immediately you do something wrong and God will get your attention and he's, you say, thank you, Lord. But it doesn't usually work that way. Because he's so patient, so patient with us, we abuse his patience. We presume on his mercy. But there can be a limit to God's patience. Genesis 6, verse 3. Just before the time of Noah, God said, My spirit will not always strive with man. My spirit will not forever strive with man. My spirit strives for a long time. Matter of fact, in this verse it says his days will be a hundred and twenty years. Noah preached for a hundred and twenty years to that generation that they might repent. God's patient. That's more than most of us live. I hope he gives me a hundred and twenty years. I hope it doesn't take that long. But he was very patient. Of course, they lived nine hundred years back then. They needed a little more time. Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 30 good verse I hope you're looking some of these up if not write them down yet for many years you had patience with them and testified against them your spirit in your prophets yet they would not listen therefore you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the land they were overcome by their enemies judgment came because they would not listen but he was so patient with them Isaiah 65 verse 12 Therefore I will number you for the sword, and you'll all bow down to the slaughter. Judgment will come. Why? Because when I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not hear. But you did evil before my eyes, and chose that in which I do not delight. They made wrong choices. They heard God, and they said no. They put them off. Procrastinated. That's why it's so important for us today when we're hearing His voice, not to harden our hearts. God is pleading with us to listen. 
He wants us to come. Now, I want to close by touching again on Lot's wife. The Bible tells us, when the angels came to Lot, it came to pass when they brought him outside, they said, escape for your life. Do not look behind you. Do not look behind you. Nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Why did she look back? First of all, God is telling us, if you choose to follow Christ, don't look back. If any man puts his hand to the plow and looks back, don't look back. Say, I'm going all the way, and I'm never going to reconsider. I thank the Lord by His grace. I bounced from one thing to another, all these different religions, until I found Christianity. And by His grace, I have never considered any other religion, because there is nothing else. And I haven't looked back. I've, I've gone up and down a little bit, but I've not looked back. And we all have our... Sometimes it's one step forward, two steps back, three steps forward, one step back. But I think I'm making progress, but I'm not looking back. I think part of the reason she looked back, she had loved ones in the city. Some of her kids, they mocked Lot when he said, flee, God's going to destroy this place. They mocked their father-in-law. She had kids there. and You'd think that'd be natural. But the Lord said, you must not love them more. Don't look back. Maybe her possessions were there. You know, you think and go back to your house. The thing is that God says, don't look back. When you choose to follow Him, our kingdom needs to be somewhere else. It's interesting also, in the days of Noah, the lost were unwilling to move off of their position. There were probably a lot of people who watched Noah build the ark. And they said, you know, the world is wicked. I'm going to have a... There's plenty of room on that ark. I'll plan on getting on board. When I see the clouds gather, when the rain starts, I'm going to get on board. But did it ever happen that way? The door was shut by the Lord before the rain ever began. They wouldn't move at the right time when they were called. Noah made an appeal, stood on the door of the ark, and said, come. And they said, oh, the sky's clear, you must be kidding. Now? Come now? And uh, they said, no, well, we'll wait. And when we see the water starting to gather, then we'll come. But God shut the door, and that was it. Probation was closed. They wouldn't move out of Sodom. They just were stuck in the rut of saying, well, you know, one of these days. But they waited too long. You know, I thought it would be healthy to look at the contrast between Lot and Sodom. I don't want to be saved like Lot. I want to be saved, I'm sorry, Lot and Noah. I want to be saved like Noah. Look at the difference. Lot was saved by the skin of his teeth. Noah was complete cooperation. Noah invested all in God's work and had no regrets about his investment. It floated during a great economy recession, didn't it? His investment. Lot waited too long and he lost his whole investment. Lot chose the life of convenience and made no preparation for the future. Noah followed a life of hardship and holiness. As a result of that, his family was saved. Noah devo devoted his life to involving his family in his work and they were saved. Lot waited to the end and it's questionable whether even his daughters were saved even though they got out of town with him God is inviting us to build an ark Noah stored away the ark for the flood to come we need to store away food don't we for that time of trouble that flood that's coming those that uh, listen they were preparing an ark we need to be preparing an ark don't we in our families be building in our church, isn't our church supposed to be an ark? That's why we keep doing evangelism here. And I'm glad you folks don't get tired of seeing other people come to the Lord. I can just look around and see so many of you who've come just in the last few years and your lives are changed by the gospel. It'll be nice to have more room for people. Folks end up coming to Central, we run out of room, and then they transfer to other churches, which is okay. But we want to be a place where people are coming to the Lord. I started talking about Rome. I might end talking about Rome. I'll never forget when I went to a place called Pompeii. I was 16 years old when I was living on that boat that went through the Mediterranean and they showed us the ruins. It's now one of the most popular tourist attractions in Italy. Back in 79 AD, it was the Sodom of the Roman Empire, Pompeii. It's where the soldiers went for R&R. &R. They can tell from the frescoes that are still on the walls in this ancient city that there was a lot of immorality. They even have a bordello there. 
with all the paintings on the wall. I can't show you pictures of that, but they're, on, they're there. And uh, very immoral life. I also think it's interesting that the same Roman legion that had been under Titus that had destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD were now vacationing in 79 AD when Mount Vesuvius erupted violently and the city was suddenly covered by ash. And it was an example of a, a catastrophic judgment that fell on that city. You know, the Bible tells us that what happened in the days of Noah and what happened in the days of Lot are set forth before us an example of how the wicked are going to perish. There are two choices. We are delivered from temptation or reserved for judgment. If we choose now to ask God to have complete control of our lives and say, Lord, deliver us. We don't want anything in our lives that comes between you and us. He'll do that for us. He's calling to us now and He wants us to come. Someday that call will be silent. Someday the door of the ark will close. Probation will cease. And that's why it's important for us to accept the blood of Christ and the sacrifice of Jesus now. To listen now. And you know, it's so much easier to get other people in the ark when we're in the ark. It's easier to pull other people in the boat when you're in the boat, isn't it? But we've got to have ourselves planted in that ark of safety. Let's pray. Loving Father, Lord, we believe that we have heard the gospel truth today. Jesus has told us that there is a limited time. The doors of mercy are open now. And we must not presume upon salvation to wait for some catastrophe in history or in the sky. Because when you come, it will seem like life is going on as normal. When probation closes, they'll be building and eating and drinking and planting and marrying. I pray, Lord, that we can hear the, whole, the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to us, be willing to capitalize on the opportunity we have right now in the blood of Christ to be forgiven, to have new hearts. I pray that each person here will make that decision, be in a special way with those that have come forward, set them free, help them to experience the righteousness by faith that Jesus offers. Thank you for your presence here, and as we do, uh, leave the house of God. I pray that your spirit will be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you've been encouraged by today's message and would like to know more of what God's Word says to you today, Amazing Facts invites you to visit our educational website at www.bibleuniverse.com. At Bible Universe, you'll discover exciting truths that will fill you with peace and purpose. The mysteries of the Bible will unfold for you at your own pace. Visit www.bibleuniverse.com today. Expand your universe.